we're going to jump straight into a, a conversation about grit. Laura, I got to spend the last like three days just reviewing this. If you, I'll, I'll probably should turn it the right way. If you haven't checked out Hunter Be Hunted, I would highly recommend that you do. Uh, Laura's done a lot in this space to to create conversations around grit. So Laura, I, I want to start with this. I, I grew up an athlete and I coached athletes. I coached youth athletes professionally for about 12 years. And my my relationship with grit has changed a lot. It used to be suffer and struggle. And I think over time, it eventually became, can I just make the hard choice, even if that means resting, even if that means slowing down, even if that means disconnecting? Was your journey of grit always like this beautifully written, updated version of grit that includes self-care? Or, or did your definition of grit change over time too? Aaron, I love that question and thank you so much. And by the way, thank you for um, having me on today and sharing your wonderful audience with me. Um, here's the thing, okay? I never wanted to be the expert in grit. I, I didn't even want to be the one who wrote the book, Hunt to Be Hunted. I didn't even want to be the creator of the global grit system. But here's why. And in answer to your question, no, I wasn't always just, I always had that mentality of grit is just uh, like pushing through and no matter what, you just, you keep on going, you keep on grinding. Um, but you said some poignant things earlier where you said, you know, sometimes like grit is knowing when to rest, right? Very difficult for athletes, especially myself, who's very competitive, very competitive. And there's been times when I haven't rested and unfortunately I've got injured as a result, you know, or I've become sick and then you try and push through it. And it's just, so yeah, there's, there's a whole story around that. Um, but yeah, so I didn't, I didn't want to be the expert in grit, but, um, unfortunately, you know, th there's been so many things that have happened in my life. And as you've read the book, you'll, you'll know, especially in chapter two, I kind of give this timeline, right. Of certain things that have happened. And it's just one thing after another, after another. Now we've all gone through hard times in our lives. Every single one of us that's listening today, even if they're listening at a later point, you've gone through a hard time at some point, but most people won't acknowledge that maybe they've learned how to navigate through that, they'd rather just get through it and then move on and never think about it again. The difference with what I've been through, and I will enlighten the audience with the most tragic part of my story, which was two and a half years ago. It was in 2021. Um, my youngest son passed away and I nearly lost my life the same evening. And for me, I've been always a natural go-getter, right? And those of you that have read the book, I know Erin, you've read it, so you understand that G and grit, I've created an acronym. I found the four elements of grit and there's the four types of grit. And I'm a G, right? I'm a go-getter. I'm a get-it-done person. That's my natural ability. That is how I was conditioned. It's it's just, it's innate in me. It's just something that I've always had and I've just harnessed that over time. When my son passed, if I had applied that very same mentality of grit and that G, um, I wouldn't be talking with you today. And I had to realize that, hang on a minute, how am I going to navigate through this? How am I going to, I mean, when you have a choice to make between burying or cremating your child and you still have to run a business and look after the team that you've developed and make sure that they've got food on their table to give to their kids make sure that you know your your own living children are doing okay and then you've got your own mental health with all the trauma and all the grief it's it's tough right you want to talk about the hard times that that's tough right and all the time knowing where's my third son he's not here anymore and it was just it's just the most tragic time in my life um, ever. And so I remember pretty vividly, it was about four months later, I actually woke up in Jack's room. That's his name, Jack. I woke up in Jack's room and I remember looking in the mirror and there was a window behind me. And this was January of 2022. So it was and I'm in Arizona. So it was, it was pretty sunny out. And the sun was just beaming through this window and it bounced off the mirror and onto my face. And it was like a light bulb just went off. And I suddenly said, you got to wake up today, your son did not. You get to feel the sun on your skin today, your son does not. Stop making this about you. It's not about you. It's about others. What are you 
do with all of that pain, all of that trauma, all of that grief? And how are you going to repurpose that to help empower other people? Because everybody goes through changes. Everybody goes through adversity. Everybody goes through hard times. But most people will fall and run back to their comfort zone because they don't have the tool to navigate through and get into that fear zone and get out of the fear zone into what I call the learning zone. Because there's a big gap between fear and growth. Because as a society, we have this growing need for instant gratification. And so it it, it really... It, it's true, right? And so we always want things now, now, now. Well, the truth is, right, we have to teach our brains. We have to rewire our thinking. Like I said, my whole life I've been, I I just know that gene, grit. But I had to pull from the R in grit, which is stands for reframe thinking. And I had to become a reframer. I had to think about the situation differently. And so on that day that I said, you know, and I started saying, well, how did I navigate through all of this over the past four months? How did I navigate through that um, really tough time? I mean, it doesn't ever go away, by the way. It's always with you. But how do you navigate through the really tough challenges that you're not used to dealing with while also being a leader, while also trying to do all the other functioning things as a human being that you're, you need to be doing, right, on a day-to-day basis? So I started realizing, okay, well, let's reverse engineer how I've actually approached all the other traumas in my life. And for those that are listening, yes, I've been through many, many traumas. Um, And again, it's all in chapter two of my book. Uh, There's a whole story there. I came to this country eight years ago with absolutely nothing, nothing but um, some clothes and my brain and a laptop, right? That was it. Um, Even went three days where I couldn't eat. So I'm telling you that I've gone through some very tough times in my life, but this one, I was never truly prepared for because who would be prepared for something like that however if I hadn't have chosen my grit from eight years ago in other words coming to this country with nothing and, and and living my own grit if I hadn't chosen my own grit then when grit found me I wouldn't have been as fully prepared and guess what no one's fully prepared for the loss of a child ever But I was able to reflect back and see what have I gone through? How did I navigate through that? How do you, how can I reverse engineer that? Pull from those strengths. And I, then I started to create this system and I realized that there were four elements to grit. And that is getting it done, which I've already talked about, right? Which comes naturally to me, reframe thinking. So instead of saying, look what happened to me, I started saying, look what happened. Look, uh, excuse me, look what revealed me. And instead of saying, look what was taken from me, I'd say, look what was given to me. And that was my way of being able to deal with the loss of my son. And so everything from that moment on became about other people. It it didn't matter anymore about my feelings, what I was going through. It mattered, how is this going to help somebody else? And if I'd wake up that day and I'd be crying my eyes out or I'd be feeling in, in a terrible, dark space, I'd say, how is this serving me? How is this helping somebody else? How is this going to help my kids? How is this going to help that the business leader I'm about to have a conversation with? It's not, right? So what can I do that's going to help them? And so I became this, um, you know, some people say I kind of became a light for them. I had a lot of people say that to me while I was going through this because I met other parents that also lost children. And it's, let me tell you, right? Whether you have support or you don't have support, you still feel alone. You do because it's, you know, and I was lucky enough that I found an incredible support group a few months later, um, which I now sit on the committee of and I help them with a lot of things. Um, They're called Heaven Hummingbirds and they're incredible. But that aside, even if you have the best support in the world or even if you don't, there's always an element of that moment when you just feel alone and it hits you. And that's where you've got to realize to yourself, okay, which part of grit can I pull from? Is it the get it done? Is it the reframe thinking? Is it the iron grit, which is all about impacting others and innovation? Or is it about the T, taking responsibility, taking ownership? And what I mean by that, because it wasn't my fault that my son passed away, but I take responsibility for my actions thereafter. So it's not, it's not about like I can feel what I feel. And you shouldn't ignore those feelings because they're there for a reason. You can feel what you feel, but how you choose to react to those feelings is very much your choice. And I always say, coming back to the I in the grit, if you can innovate your way out of a challenge, it's not a challenge, it's an opportunity. And I saw this as a door to help 
thousands and thousands and thousands of people in business, whether it, they need to apply this in their personal life, it doesn't really matter. You can use the global grid system throughout, whether you're a leader, whether you're a seasoned leader, an emerging leader, an aspiring leader, or you're a parent, right? Or you want your kids to learn this. It doesn't really matter. In fact, there's something really cool I'm working on right now, which I'm kind of keeping a little hush hush, but, um, it's, it's really awesome to see the amount of people, not just in business, but outside of that, that have just like grabbed onto this. And I mean, I've got, you know, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Northwestern Mutual, IBM, all of these big companies who I've either worked with, spoken for, or they've um, endorsed the book. And they see, wow, this global grid system is a game changer because it will change the way that we approach life. And just coming back to that tease, sorry, Erin, just want to mention this because you said about being an athlete. That was one of the hardest ones for me for knowing when to rest, right? And that's something that I've learned over time. But having built this grit system and developed it, and now I understand the four different types of grit as well, which I've created something called the grit type indicator, which is kind of like the disc assessment, but in grit, it assesses how gritty you are in certain situations or like which one you're more dominant in. Well, the T is all about taking that responsibility and ensuring that whatever actions you're taking, it's not just about you, right? Whatever action or inaction you take, it has consequences, but it has consequences for other people as well. And so if I continue to get injured, if I continued to get sick when I, as an athlete, right, how is that helping anybody? It's not. Right, exactly. the whole team is influenced. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, it, I mean, I could go, I could talk to you for hours about all of this, you know, there's so many like in, in depth stuff. And that's why I actually created workshops around it. And I created programs and obviously I keynote speak all across the country, um, specifically on grit, right. And not just any type of grit, but how do you grit through things and using a system because people think, oh, well, you're born with it or, I can't use grit because I'm going to get burnt out. But let me tell you something. Grit doesn't lead to burnout. What leads to burnout is grit unchecked. So we have to check our grit using the five pillars. And you've read the book, so you know what I'm talking about. It's in chapter three, right? We talk about the five pillars. It's so essential, right? And it's not just essential for people like you and me, Aaron, who are athletes, right? It's also essential for anybody in life that wants to achieve and wants to get to that high level. I mean, I coach executives in some top Fortune 100 companies. And let me tell you, some of them don't apply the five pillars and I've had to teach that to them. The moment they start to even grasp one or two of them, they see everything change. And so once they have established all five, it is incredible that even though they've been so successful, they kind of reach that barrier, right? A lot of us do. We kind of, we, we get into our comfort zone, we get out of the comfort zone, we get into the fear zone, we get into the learning zone, achieve growth. And then we get tired and we're like, okay, well, we're just, that growth now becomes a new comfort. And it's like, okay, well, you know, maybe it's somebody else's turn. They can now do this or whatever. And, um, what happens is they just feel the sense of burnout because they don't know now how to take responsibility, right? Of knowing when to rest or knowing when to push forward, when to push through and when to just hold back. They don't know how to pull from the R or the I or the T. Maybe they're just used to just go, 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 right? Or if they're an I, they don't always know um, which innovation it is that they should be focused on solely in order to propel the company forward. And so, that's why the global grid system is so helpful because it also helps the team understand how other people see them, right? So how you communicate with people even in a gritty situation. Like, so if, if any type of change or adversity happens, how you're going to react to that is, you know, could be completely different to how a team member would react to it. So you have to pull from each other's strengths and know, okay, in this situation, I probably need an R and an I and a T and I can be the G, right? But as a unit together, as a team, you can go so much further. So yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot to it, as you can tell. <laughs> I like it. I, I think the, the threads that are interesting to me too, is that you've at least in the writing, and I, I assume this happens bigger than writing, you've threaded the emotional part with the scientific part, which I think is very hard to do in a book alone, let alone the larger space of human connection, business, operations, et cetera. One of the things that that I'm really curious about, in the last, last couple of years for me have involved a lot of grief and simultaneously have also had so much beauty attached to them. But I think that there's 
this misnomer in the world of leadership, in the world of speakers, in the world of of coaches, even in the, the conversation about mindset, where we expect that someone in a leadership position is is almost a robot. They're they're so good at what they do that they are infallible and they're they're gritty, but the observation from the outside is they don't hurt, they don't bleed. And and grief to me is a is a relatively new friend. I've had to go through the strangely organized five steps of grief like 37 times. But grief comes in in waves. And I really love how you describe being able to experience it fully. So in leadership in particular, how, how do you see grief and grit working together? How, how does someone, if they're, if they're going through grief or hard times are on them and they're trying to be strong as a leader, trying to, to carry the way of the team, but also be human in a very, I don't know, kind of cold world where no one seems to tie these together. How does a leader say, okay, I'm experiencing grief and I'm going to be gritty at the same time? I love that question because obviously that's something that I've been through, right? And as you said, grief comes in waves. Grief doesn't actually ever go away, right? So it's, you know, for myself, I grieve my son every day, right? There's not a day that goes by that I don't miss my my sweet boy, Jack, right? Um, So how do you navigate the grief and the grit? Well, that's where you have to understand fully the four elements. You can't necessarily be that. So I'm just going to use myself as an example because I've said I'm a G, right? Um, did you take the mini assessment, by the way, Erin? I haven't curious. yet. It's on my hey, to do list. Okay, you have to take it and tell me what you are. But um, when you find out and you know what the grit type indicator is that you are. So for example, for me, I'm a G, right? And I'm heavily a G. I'm probably followed closely by an I, but I'm heavily a G. And that's when I have to pull back and realize when the grief hits me that it's okay to experience that. Here's the problem that we have, especially leaders. And not all leaders think this, but there are leaders that I've come across that think emotions can be a negative, like they get in the way. You know, and just be logical, 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 right? I understand that. I'm a logical person myself. But let me tell you that as human beings, our emotional part of our brain is the oldest part of our brain. It's the oldest part of our brain. And so that is why we are wired naturally to react with an emotion. It's there to protect us, right? If you look back 10,000 years, you know, if we didn't react with an emotion or if we didn't experience fear or we we weren't, you know, didn't experience joy or whatever it may be, like it would have affected us in a huge way. We probably wouldn't be here today. And so therefore, we have to learn how to harness those emotions and use them as a positive, which we can. And this is why, right? Because I hear this a lot about technology and AI and all of this other, um, you know, stuff that's coming in that people, I, it's like a split conversation. Some people love it. Some people really dislike it. I think that we can live in a world with both. Um, but if you think that AI is going to be so much better than a human and therefore, um, humans are going to become useless. Let me tell you, humans have the emotion, right? And if you learn how to use that positively, you will always have the upper hand, right? And so, um, I don't, I think you, you probably read this part in the book, but I talk about how we are wired to think negatively. And so 80% of our thoughts are actually negative and 90% are repetitive. And that is huge. So therefore, even right now, Erin, you're probably having a negative thought coming into your head, right? There's, there's we're, we're always sitting here, we have negative thoughts. And now you're probably finding me saying, no, I'm not. What are you talking about? No, I'm not, right? But it's it's repeating. And so we as human beings have to recognize that, acknowledge it. Don't just try to push it off. So if that grief hits, why are you trying to be gritty? Don't just push it off and ignore it because guess what? It's going to come back and bite you at some point really, really hard, really hard. And then you really will struggle. So it's it's best to acknowledge it, right? Sit in it even for a minute, right? Acknowledge it, feel what you want to feel, but then choose how you want to react and say, is this serving me right now? You say, thank you, but no, thank you. And you kind of move it, you know, into a box and you put it that little box on a shelf and it's it's locked away in a shelf. And if you need to unlock that box and f- sit with that emotion for a minute, that's okay. But you're going to be the one that's in control of that. And so if you think about your emotions and put them in little boxes and lock them up and put them on the shelf and when you want to feel that, or even if it just starts creeping up on you and you say, it's okay, I'm in a safe space, 
I can open that box. I'm going to feel it for a minute, but then I'm going to put it back in and I'm going to put it back up on the shelf, right? Because that's your logic now talking. And your logic is saying, it's okay, feel it. But now how are you going to choose to react to it? That's the big differentiator. And if you can master that and harness the emotion with the logic, that's where you're going to win. So good. The, you know, I, I have a shitload of negative thoughts. And I actually think that to to your point, it's the ability to hear your own thoughts and learn from them that has probably changed the the majority of the last season that I've been through. And and there's a whole lot of nonsensical literature that would suggest that if you are again in a leadership position, if you're renowned, if you've published a book, that you just don't have this stuff as if there's a whole different human experience and and an, I find that the wider I've gone in learning emotions, uh, coming from a guy that had like one emotion for the majority of my teen and 20s, expanding that spectrum has really been, can I experience more negative because then I unlock more positive? If I wanted to experience more joy, I had to accept more pain. Ha has been a, an interesting lesson. And I think that grit in some ways my relationship with grit has largely changed from the, I'm just going to subject myself to more pain to, I'm going to understand what the pain is so that I can learn and grow and evolve. I, I'd, I'd be curious to understand this because you said harnessing emotions. And, and I think that the compartmentalization that we have when we run a business and emotions is, is a really important thing. You, you got to be able to do that whether that's you're speaking on stage and you're crying in the back beforehand or you step into somebody else's problems and need to set yours to the side. But compartmentalization can also lead to this uh, like unsophisticated walling off of everything. And all of a sudden you're numb. I've, I've been there too. Part of that has been navigating grief. Part of that has also been trying to learn about an emotion that might be outside of my knowledge base. My opinion is that the future, uh, I've got a 21 month old, so I'm a new dad. And I think the future is largely going to be two intelligences, emotional intelligence, EQ, which happened to be his initials, or essentially TQ, technology intelligence. Can you, can you use these both? If we're moving towards a place where emotions are more important and managing people requires more emotional intelligence and harnessing of emotions, what does a leader need to do so that they can help someone navigate their emotions? Do they need to be able to decompartmentalize? Like, how, how do they get better so they can help someone else do it? Here's the biggest piece of advice I can give anybody, right? As whether you're a leader or you're not a leader, you, this is absolutely fundamental. You have to know what your why is. You have to know your purpose and your mission. If you don't know your purpose and your mission, and I'm not talking about your company's purpose and mission, I'm talking about your individual purpose and mission, then it doesn't matter what you're trying to achieve. If you don't know what that is, you're never going to get there. Here's why. Because when you've got gritty situations, say grit chooses you, right? You've got to navigate through a challenge, no matter how severe it is or how minor, right? whenever change happens, any type of adversity, if you wake up that morning and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't do this today, right? Think back to me when my son passed and I had a company to run and I thought there were days I was like, I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't. I didn't even want to shower. I just wanted to go under a cover and just remain there for the rest of the day. I, I just wanted to be in a dark, dark space because I felt like I was in a prison, right? And there's going to be days where you don't feel like doing the thing that you know you should be doing you know what? Every day I wake up and you see this little pin on me here. And those that are listening and, and can't see, I'm actually wearing a little pin of baby feet. I wear it every single day. And this is my reminder um, of why I do what I do, right? It's a reminder that Jack doesn't get to do what I'm doing. And therefore he'll never get to impact the world in the way that he may have wanted to, right? I am now doing that for him. But as a result, when I wake up in the morning, if there's something that I don't feel like doing, I just say, nope. Sorry, you don't get that choice because you got to wake up today. So because you got to wake up, you remind yourself what your purpose is. And my, pur my purpose in life is to empower belief and transform futures. It's that simple, right? My mission in life is to impact at least one person for at least one day for every day I'm breathing.
Now, my company's mission is that I want to create the largest network of grit activated leaders, but my individual mission is very different. It's I want to impact at least one person for at least one day for every day I'm breathing. And if I do that, like, how do I keep myself accountable for that? Because I talk to my son in the evening, like at, at bedtime. I had him cremated, so I have his urn and I always talk to him at night. And I tell him about the day. And for me, that gives me peace and relief, right? So no matter what you're going through, as a leader, you have to know what your purpose and mission is to help others, right? How do you expect others to follow you or be inspired by you or look up to you? If you don't know your own path on the days that it's tough. So you have to know your why. Finding a why is an interesting journey. Uh, I, I think back to a number of moments in my life where there was maybe shame around not having a a clear mission. I remember doing a couple exercises. I had coaches that, that helped me figure it out. But I, I go back to uh, all of our work really stems around beliefs. And I want to I wanna tie this thread from your book as well, because I think you do a great job of this. The, there was a long time where I didn't believe I was worthy of a purpose. If, if there are three things that I've struggled with most in my life, it's been believing I was worthy, believing I was enough, and believing I was lovable. Those three things have been a deep challenge for me. So I've had to change a lot over time. And in the in the world of let's find your purpose, I, I do think there's a lot of a lot of vernacular and words, and people are like, "We'll take this framework and this like, let's just find this quiz to get you your mission and your personal thing." But it's got to be rooted in in something really special. Yeah. If someone is struggling, I want to talk about beliefs, but but before we even get there, if someone's struggling to figure out what their purpose is. Are they finding it? Are they building it? Are they, is that an internal question? Is it an external exercise? How does somebody go about building something that's so big and so important? They first of all have to put themselves in an environment in which they feel comfortable to learn. And what I mean by that is they've got to have the autonomy to learn in the way that they want to. This is the biggest thing about belief, right? And having that self-belief in your, in like, you're never going to get to a purpose of mission if you don't really understand who you are, right? And how do you understand who you are? Put yourself in those environments. So for example, with yourself, Erin, you said that um, you struggled for a long time to, you know, you, you didn't have that self-belief. You didn't think you were worthy and so forth. Um, I, I'd probably ask you in that case that, or probably tell you that I imagine you didn't have the environment in which you could thrive. And therefore, when you put yourself in an environment in which you have the autonomy to learn in the way that you want to, because there's three different learning styles, right? We learn through vision, we learn through listening, we learn through practical, um, and everybody's going to learn differently. So when I'll use this example when I'm up on stage, right? And I'm speaking or when I'm giving a workshop and I've got a whole, you know, big big audience, whether it's 500 people, 1,000 people, 6,000 people, right? doesn't really matter to me the audience size. Sometimes workshops can be 30 or 40 people. But whatever the size of the audience, every single person in there is going to learn differently. You're going to have some that learn from a visual perspective, some that learn through listening and some that learn through practical. So it's my job, it's my duty to make sure that I cover all three different learning styles. But you as the individual have to find that coach or that mentor or that speaker or whoever it is, right, that is able to do that. Because otherwise you're going to leave there not having the tools that you need to carry out the very things you want to you want to carry out. So in order to achieve belief, we first of all have to put ourselves in the environment in which we can choose the autonomy in which to learn. Once we have that environment, and we are in control of that, right? We've put ourselves in that environment. Once we have that, it does create that belief. What does the belief do? You've read the book, so you should know this. But the belief uh, creates the motivation. What does the motivation do? And I talk about this in chapter five, by the way, of the book. But what does the motivation do? It now, there you go. See? Yeah, you got it. You got it. You 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 pulled up. You pulled up. Page my, fifty, uh, everyone. Page. Page fifty. There you are. Page fifty. You can just jump straight. <laughs> I love that. Um, So the motivation now influences how you think. And when you influence how you think, that's then where the magic happens with the learning zone, right? Where you can alter your brain processes. That is an absolutely essential step. If you don't alter the way you think and you don't follow the the system behind that, you're never going to get to the end um, goal, right? So once you've altered your brain process, that now allows you to have a growth mindset, which you absolutely have to have in order to 
adopt the very thing that it is you're trying to learn in the first place, which in this case would be the global grid system, right? So you have it starts with the environment, and I call it your culture of excellence, right? You, you've read that in the book as well, but it's it's all about the people you're around, the environment you're in, um, and that's why I left. That's why I left England eight years ago, because not that you know I. It's, you know, I, I love England, but it's just, I didn't feel like I was in the environment in which I could thrive. And I had an amazing career over there. I was actually a sales director. I was a business development director. I helped build companies from the ground up into multi-million dollars of worth of business or well, pounds over there. But it was, it was amazing. I had an incredible career, but I just got to a point where I felt that you know, because of some tragedies that had happened over there in my in my time, and you can read about it in the book, there was an incredible company that I helped build and worked for, and I'd left them a few years prior because I was I was planning on coming to the states earlier. Um, but then I was married before I was married to a, to U.S. Air Force, and um, he was going to be uh, stationed back out in America, and I was supposed to be going with him. And then, unfortunately, you know, some more tragedy happened, and um, we ended up divorced. And so therefore my whole life changed. And I said, okay, now the life that I thought I was going to have over there, which I'd conditioned my head to no longer was going to happen. And so over time, those last few years I spent in England, I wasn't happy anymore. Right. I was like, well, I, what was my identity? And so I started, you know, I struggled with that for a bit and I went through some other trauma, unfortunately, to, to finally figure out who I was and, 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 you know, where, where I am today. Um, and I don't mind sharing this because you're going to read it in the book, but I was actually beaten severely, you know, uh, two years prior to coming out to the States. And, I think it was at that point in my life and it took two years to get him convicted, but he was convicted. And then after those two years have passed, I just said, you know, that's it. You know, I, I need to start again. I want to have a really fresh start. Um, and I want to prove to people that you really can do anything you want to do, no matter what's been thrown at you. You could have some of the life's hardest things that have been thrown at you. And trust me, I know some incredible veterans that have lost limbs and they thrive in, like, it's, it's incredible to watch them. Like, I'm just like, wow, I'm in awe of them. Right. And I'm like, look at what they can do. And so when I'm training, right. And this is true story. When I'm training and I feel tired, right. If I'm on the air bike, if I'm on the runner and I'm, and I'm having to throw these weights about and I am tired, right? I say, oh no, you think about your friends who are veterans that don't get to do this because they don't have the limb to do it. So you, it's a privilege to be alive and it's a privilege to have everything that we have. So use it and use it well and use it wisely and also use that as an inspiration for others to show them what they can be capable of doing. So Yes, it's it's a process, right, in order to get to where you want to get to. But like I said, if you don't follow that to the T, so remember page 50 in the book, Erin told you just now. If you, don't, if you don't follow that process to a T, you will consistently fall back to the comfort zone, right? We have the comfort zone, the fear zone, the learning zone, and the growth zone, right? Think of it like a like a circle. I usually draw it on my whiteboard. But um, they're like four semicircles. In order to get out of the comfort and get to the fear, what do we have to use? We have to get it done, right? We have to use our G in grit. Once we once we are able to step out and just get things done and we get into our fear zone, most people either remain stuck or they get scared and they run back to comfort. So they have that fight or flight. Um, I actually got fight, flight or freeze. Um, and so to get out of fear and get into the learning zone, we have to pull from the R in grit. We have to reframe how we think about it in order to get out of that fear zone because otherwise we're just going to run straight back to the comfort again. And then once we're in the learning zone, how do we get out of learning? Because we want to continue to learn, but we also don't just want to remain stuck there. Otherwise, it's like reading a good book, shoving it on the shelf, it's collecting dust, and we're never going to use it again. So we want to utilize what it is that we're now learning. So we have to pull from the iron grit. And remember, it's not about you, it's about others. And how are you going to innovate your way out of challenges for it not to be a challenge, but for it to be an opportunity? So then once you've mastered the I, where the T comes in and, and then you achieve the growth, that it's now your responsibility to start that whole process again. And where your growth once was is now your new comfort, comfort level. And then you just continue that that growth. Um, and so it's it's a whole process. But you can continue to level up your success over and over, even if you got to a very high level of success and you think, well, how do I now push through? There's always going to be a different way that you can think about something to get to that next level, right? If you feel stuck, 
It's probably because you're burnt out, right? And so therefore you need to um, unleash the creative side, which comes naturally to some, doesn't come naturally to others. That's where you have to learn the skills of the eye. So just read the book. And then and chapter eight is all about the eye, by the way. So <laughs> this, this is one of the better structures I've seen with belief. Uh, you know, in our work, we spend a lot of time on beliefs. The The definition that we like to use is, is that a belief is a choice of truth. And I've had, I don't know, hundreds of people say like, well, why would I invest in a mindset coach? Or why, why would I invest in anything that would shift beliefs? And there's a lot of rhetoric around limiting beliefs and all that. But I also really appreciate this, this graphic. Again, page 50, the, the objective of belief to me is, is it's the beginning of change. And you've done a great job here of, of outlining that. And I really, really loved how throughout the book, you use the word divergent thinking yes. to, to combine the sides of the brain, the analytic and the creative yep. is a, is a unique thing. I, I think that school has done a shit job of making it very easy to just fall in one lane. And if you're an artist, you're an artist and, and then you're not expected to have this logical side. Yep, agreed. You're expected to be emotional. You're expected to be dramatic. You're expected. There's just so many weird expectations. And then if you're logical, well, be an engineer. That was my advice. You're good at math, so be an engineer. And the way that I learned this was from, uh, uh, I'll connect with you on, on this. Wh where in England are you from? London, just north of London. Nice. So I'm a, I'm a f footballer through and through. So I had to pick a team when I was young. I had, I, I picked Chelsea. I don't know if you're I'm a Chelsea say, fan, but I'm, I'm a Chelsea say, fan. This is, is going to be forever more on here, but I hate soccer. I love <laughs> American football. I love football so much, but I love American football. I hate soccer. Interesting. So one thing I learned from soccer, from football was, and, and I think this is true in American football, true is how do you do what's unexpected, right? How do you yeah. do what's different? And, yeah. and this idea of divergence is, is really fascinating. Uh, soccer can be a very long game to watch because it's, it's such a buildup sport. But both American football and football require a degree of the logic and a degree of this creative divergent thinking. Creative divergent thinking is hard to train because it's it's less bound by the rules it's it's out of bounds it's designed to be chaotic and needs some sort of experience to really understand it for someone that is really tapped in and tuned to their analytical side they they like know that works it functions it performs how do they train how do they change their belief how do they nurture the more creative blossoming side of them okay i love this question so I'm going to use my example, okay, from when I lost my son, right? I'm a logical thinker. Uh, I'm, I'm born that way. I'm also a very creative individual, but I, in in times of stress or change or you know anything like that, I'm very logical about it. However, emotions are innate, right? They're part of us, and um, if you if you can understand how to communicate with other people that are creative, if you're a logical thinker, you will slowly start to learn their way of thinking. And so therefore, if you are faced with a situation that maybe you would have immediately reacted with a logical side, take a step back for a moment and say, how do I look at this from a creative standpoint and also a logical standpoint? And where is where do I meet in the middle? So what I mean by that is um, take somebody that is an R, for example, reframer. They are a naturally logical person. Also, Gs are actually naturally logical. Both are very logical. They use the left part of their brain and they're very logical thinkers. However, innovative people and people that take responsibility are more creative in their approach, right? They just, they, they think slightly differently about things, right? Um, and so therefore, but the pace at which they do it, all four of them is very different. So let me explain. A G and an R, even though they're logical, they're very different in their pace. And R has to process things. They are more process driven. They like to take their time. They like to be more perfect. They like to perfect things, right? Whereas a G, they don't want to perfect things. They just want to get it done. They're logical about it, but they're just really fast paced, right? So Gs and Rs can actually sometimes rub each other up the wrong way because an R will feel like the, the, what the G is doing is a threat to the R's accuracy on certain situations, right? Yep. Just that sounds like Marty and I. 
right? <laughs> I love that. 100%. Love that. Right? Well, and then you take an I and a T. Both are very creative, right? They are more emotional. In other words, they, they, they're they more emotional intelligent. They can tap into those emotions. Um, however, I wouldn't say they're more emotionally intelligent. It's more that they're very creative, right? So they tend to use emotions to make decisions, whereas Gs and Rs tend to make logical decisions. Um, but sometimes in situations, and by the way, a I and a T um, are very different in their pace. So a T is actually a lot more slower, whereas an I is a lot more fast paced. So G's and I's can get on very well in that case, you know, because they're both fast paced, but sometimes they can do each other's head in because the I is so creative and yet the G is just, I just want to get this done. And the I is saying, no, 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 but I've got this idea and I've got this idea and I've got that one. Whereas the G is like, let's just focus on one and then just go with it. Right. So, so we have to learn how we can pull from each other's strengths in that um, instance. But the more that we understand our grit types, the more that we understand how a G and R and I or a T operates, we learn from them. So if you you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes that is an I, for example, if you're naturally a G, you then start to be able to think the way that they do. Now, here's why this is important. Because when you're, when you're in a team setting, right, the, it's not about how you see yourself, it's about how others see you. And so when you're encoding something, how you or how you encode that to some and, and, and tell somebody what it is that you're thinking or maybe um you're you're trying to set like a direction or whatever it is that you're trying to do with that particular individual or that team, how they are decoding it is very different to how you are encoding it. That's very important for people to understand. Um, because like I said, how you think that you're communicating with someone is in a manner that they should instantly be able to get. Well, what if I'm a G communicating with a T? You know, I'm fast paced, get it done. The T is more, whoa, 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 whoa. You have to slow <laughs> down. I have to think with my emotion. Do you see what I mean? Very uh, different. I, Very different. I, so I'm probably G and I had a director of education that was a T. Okay. And hands down, if the, the way, and I think a lot of visionaries are Gs and a lot of integrators are Ts. And I've, I, I felt like as a visionary, I was running with a parachute. I just, bleh, come on, man, let's go. And yeah. he felt like he was trying to pin down the wind. So I, I fully agree with the tension that's there. Yeah, no, for sure. And by the way, visionaries typically are eyes, but you, mm. you know, also G's that are visionaries, but eyes are very innovative, very innovative with their thinking, but they just ten, tend to sometimes get a little lost with all their different ideas. So they have so many, <laughs> yeah. and they then don't know which one to do. And that's where the G comes in. It's like, okay, well, we've got this. This is a great one. Let's, let's roll with this one. Right. I like it. But, but sometimes G's can come in a little bit hard charging and be like, okay, we're going to do this, this, this. And they have to be mindful. Hang on a minute that could come across as very threatening to mm -hmm. others that need to take their time with something. So, I mean, I have a great analogy, like of how I, um, you know, when I'm giving workshops and all of this, it, it's, it's really fun actually. And, um, when you're in a group setting, I kind of, you know, we do a little bit of role play and it's, it's a lot of fun because then people can actually realize and practice the, the very techniques that they have to have and that they need to understand in order to become an I or a T or an R just at the drop of a hat, right? Because you have to do that in certain situations. So like I said, when I went through my tragedy and I lost my son, if I had just continually applied the G, I wouldn't be sitting here today. I would be a shadow of my former self because I wouldn't have allowed myself to experience the grief. I wouldn't have allowed myself to understand why what happened happened, right? And sometimes there is no answer. But and in my case, that there actually wasn't, I haven't even gone into the story of, of what happened, but um, I mean, I talk about it in chapter two of my book, but um, it's just, I had to realize that I had to take a step back and slow things down a little bit. And that's not naturally me, but I had to. And it actually, because I slowed down a little bit, it helped me go faster. Yeah. And so that's what we have to learn as human beings when we can tap into those emotions and use them in a positive manner and in a way that's going to excel us, not hurt us. Mm -hmm. That's how you unlock the next level of success. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of slowing down as much as it might be, I'll say frustrating. It can also be the hardest thing in the world to do. Laura, I, I'm, I've really. I hope that you are listening to Laura because that that is a avoidance. It's an avoidance tactic that I think many go getters tend to share, probably ours as well, where it's just blitz and blitz and blitz, and slowing down can be a 
a really powerful tool. I, I want to ask you this. Th- this is more my curiosity about not not the content of the book, but ha- the arrival here. Mm-hmm. It's you've essentially spent a lot of time building frameworks. And as a guy that builds a lot of frameworks and, and tools and tinkers for, for people to get kind of boxed in and stuck and they have to just reflect or self-assess or diagnose, where, where did the skill come for building frameworks? Like way, way back in the day, because this this, these are not easy to build. Right. Um, well, obviously, I have a heck of a lot of experience in my in my life, right? Not just through trauma and grief. And if the audience is listening again, there's a timeline of things that I've gone through, right? So you'll you'll, you'll be cut, begin to understand a little bit more. But it's a timeline of trauma and grief. Um, however, I also have a bachelor's in psychology. Um, I trained at master level for mental health counseling, and then also I'm trained in neuroscience. So I pull from a lot of cognitive sciences, and that's actually how the R in grit was really, um, really came about. Obviously through my experience as well, but it was the experience that set it apart. So anybody could. Um, you know, study psychology and start to learn human behavior and try to pull some of this, you know, together. But I will tell you that there were hundreds of hours of research in this. I've got over 200 references in the book. And with some of my framework, there's like bits and pieces of the process that I just told you about, you know, the environment and the belief, the motivation, altering how you think. That process, it's like tiny bits and pieces of it out there segmented, but no one's actually pieced everything together. And I remember it really vividly because I was outside um, enjoying the sunshine as I was writing this book. And it was, I was d- like putting together this process and I got bitten by a spider. And those people that know, I don't, I don't like spiders, right? But I got bitten by a spider. And if you've ever had a spider bite, oh my gosh, it actually burned and itched and it was horrific and actually spread all across my leg. It was really red for about a week. But I, <laughs> I, it must have given me something because it was like a light bulb that just went off in that moment. And I thought, Oh my goodness. And that's when I discovered this process from all the research that I've been doing. And it's just started to click in my head that, wow, this is why most leadership programs fail because they don't actually like they, they is, they think it's just about interpersonal communication. The leadership is more than just interpersonal communication, right? It's about getting it done, reframing how you think, impacting others and taking responsibility. And what does that spell? Grit. So leadership is grit. You can't be a leader without it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And then obviously my entire experience from a young age growing up to where I am today and going through what I've been through um, and just reverse engineering all the success that I've had as a result of of navigating through tough times. And one of the biggest things is, Erin, a lot of people in my situation may have given up a long time ago and nobody would blame them. Nobody would blame them. All right. It's not, we don't judge anybody, right? We're not, I'm not going to say, no, you know, you, you, you can't, you know, if, if you can't continue, that's it. You just got to give up. I'm, I'm here to tell you that that's your choice, right? You, you have a choice whether you want to give up or you don't. I just choose not to give up ever. And why? Because I plan on stay, sticking around for a very, very long time, right? And I've witnessed my son passing away. I nearly lost my life. And when I say I nearly lost my life, I mean, I was seconds from flatlining. My blood pressure had plummeted to 53 over 37. How I was still awake, I still don't know to this day. Um, but, but I actually applied a technique that I now teach a lot of other people, um, which is, I mentioned it briefly in the book, but it's called the 54321 technique. And it's all about the senses, the five things you can um, see, the four things you can hear, three things you can feel, and so on and so on. And um, it actually helps reduce anxiety, it re- reduces stress. And even in those moments of near death, um, it helps helped slow my, my heart rate down because my body did not have enough blood in it. So therefore, my heart wasn't able to pump the blood around my body. And so my organs were shutting down one by one. So I'd actually said my goodbyes to my husband and I pictured my living kids. I was like, this is the last thing I'm going to see. But I applied my 54321. I said, you have a choice. You either accept it and you die or you accept it, you die anyway. They're going to bring you back. And I just kept saying, they're going to bring me back. They're going to bring me back. And um you, the only thing that you can control is is your thinking about the situation. And that's what I did in that moment. I mean, I'm a fighter, so I will just continue to fight. But if you get tired, right, and you're not even in the situation like that, and you just get tired and you're like, but I don't know if I've got any more grit in me. Yes, you do. You just need to tap into a different level of it, right? We can't always be G's. We can't always be R's. We can't always be I's. We can't always be T's. Why? Because sometimes it gets boring, right? As well, women like that. And as human beings, we have to challenge ourselves. 
And so, and I'm naturally competitive. So I, I was like, I, I want to build something that I know everybody can utilize. And here's the biggest myth around grit, right? People think that, oh, grit's just something that some people have and other people don't. No, we all have grit. When we were babies, we learned how to walk. We learned how to talk, right? Couldn't do that if um, we, we couldn't do that if we didn't have grit, right? It's just that we don't remember it. And grit is a muscle, right? So grit can be grown. The more we use it, the more we have it. So I always encourage people, choose your grit, right? Put yourself in a gritty situation and choose that grit versus um, allowing that grit to choose you. Because the moment that you get to choose the grit, that's when you start building the tools, you start building um, that resilience and you learn from it, right? It's so important that we learn from it. And here's the thing. I always say that grit is not about running away from the situation. It's about changing your perspective in the midst of the situation. Yeah, you have to be in it to be able to change it, which goes back to your take of responsibility too. Can't run. So two more questions. Well, uh, this one is just a like a one sentence, one line, or whatever comes through your heart. Our brand is called Get Out of Your Own Way. And there's a line I want to connect to all this. But what what does it mean to get out of your own way to you? Oh, it's a good question. What does it mean to get out of my own way? Um, it's changed my thinking. Right? I like it. So yeah, it's changed my thinking. If I and that's the, that's really the R in grit, but it's changed my thinking. It's actually the hardest one to do out of all all four elements is the is the R. I think, yeah, you, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're in really challenging situations I, during yeah. COVID in the first 14 hours of COVID, almost every business that I had, I just published a book and just built a tech platform. And both of those industries went like so fast. It was yeah. nuts. So I, I agree with you. I think R is, is really hard to reframe that moment into a, a, an opportunity versus a catastrophic loss. It ain't, ain't so easy, but you also, th this line out of all the lines in here, first of all, if you're still listening here, you have got to get a copy of this book. Uh, Laura, I will give you a compliment that I, I reserve for very few. There are so many books where I can read them. And in the first three chapters, I get it. And I'm like, okay, the rest of the chapters are just new stories to help me get it, but I get it. You've packed so much in here as far as frameworks and structures and tools. It's magic. It's fucking magic. Uh, this is the end, or close to the end. And it's a line that really deeply connects with something I believe and I think needs to be shared more often. So here's a line and then we can quickly chat about it. If you're committed to making a change, but unsure where to start, understand that the answer isn't out there. It's within you. Mm -hmm. It is really difficult sometimes to dismantle the externalities in entrepreneurship mm -hmm in the pursuit of better relationships, yep. in the pursuit of higher quality experience, it's really hard to take that off and mm -hmm. look in the mirror and say like, mm, I'm the problem. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's been a big part of your journey mm -hmm. and you reflect on it really well. But how, how do you see others being able to set down, what, what kind of tactics can they use to set down this very materialistic, externalized, just mm -hmm. pay money to somebody else yeah. kind of world? There's one word that I have for that, and it's elimination, right? You have to eliminate the distractions around you. We can all get distracted with different things, right? We can have, you know, if, you, if you're if you focused on something, but then you, you can allow a distraction to come in, guess what? You're now, you're off track. And so if you understand how to eliminate those distractions and always, always surround yourself with excellence. And what I mean by that is creating that culture of excellence, right? So you set the bar and anyone that's around you and so forth, like, okay, you can help people, but you also want to always be learning. You want to have people that are better than you at something, right? I always say, if you want to be a lion, you train with them. Sure. Like, yes, it's, it's true. Like, I, and I can relate to this as an athlete as well, not not just as a as a leader in business or as a coach or as a, a great um, connection, an author, but as an as an athlete. You know, some of the people I train with, oh my gosh, like you, like pe people comment all the time, like, how do you do that, Lara? And you're like, this is incredible, like what you're doing, blah blah blah. Well, let me tell you, if you saw some of the people that I trained with, now you'd understand <laughs> how I. I did, right? Yeah. I was like a little baby cub that was like bouncing in one day, just saying, I want to play, you know, I want to play, let me play, right? And then I'm like tossed into that arena and I'm like, 
holy smokes, like what just happened, right? But now I'm not seen as the baby cub anymore, right? I'm kind of like, you know, I like to say I'm the young lion, like trying to get after it and get, get to that, you know, king status. But it's it's amazing when you surround yourself with others that are, you know, are even more experienced or have done more than you in that field, or maybe they're not... Um, maybe they're just talented in other areas, right? So it could be that if you're in a team setting, you've got some people that have got more experience in some other part that maybe you're not as experienced in. Pull from that, right? Use that, but eliminate the negativity. Do not have negativity around you whatsoever. I'm telling you this, like from someone that knows, I left a country where I felt there was a lot of negativity over there. Um, maybe it was some of the people I was surrounded with. I don't know, but I just felt like I had to get into my own um, environment create that i mean maybe it was because i didn't see the sun for 30 something years of that's my a life real thing. You know? so that's it is a real thing right now, I'm listening it's better here. i love the heat i love the heat let me tell you this i hate the cold i hate it so i'm like give me sunshine any day and i'm there but seriously like when you build that culture of excellence when you have people around you that are inspiring when you have positive people around you like have a coach, have a mentor. Do you think I have them? Of course I do. I have them all around me, right? I have an incredible coach. He's a, he's a marine marine raider um, for my athleticism, right? He he trains me, especially for competitions, right? That That's incredible. I have coaches for my business, right? It's just, you have to always learn from others. You don't know it all. And if you think you know it all, you have a fixed mindset. And therefore I would encourage you, I would encourage you to read the book, Hunt or Be Hunted, and learn about how you achieve that growth mindset. And if you do have a growth mindset, read the book anyway, because guess what? You're going to learn something from it. We don't know everything, right? Do you think I just wrote that book with not being able to research? No, of course not. I did, I I just said this, over 200 references in that book. I wanted everything to be scientifically backed. So for my logical thinkers, they realized, okay, this is um, absolutely, you know, scientifically backed, it's real. And for my um, emotional thinkers and my more creative thinkers, they start to see it from a different perspective. And then they're like, oh my gosh, now I can think of grit differently. And so all those people that I thought you had to be much and much more like pushing those sleds, you know, down. No, it's not just about that, right? There's an element of that, but it's not just about that. I like to joke with that because a lot of people know me for, for pushing sleds, but um, it's not just about that, right? It's about not just getting it done, but reframing how you think impacting others and taking responsibility mm. it is it's so the, what a I'll, I'll give you proof of this there are 18 pages of references in the back so laura's not talking <laughs> smack there uh i, I also I, I do think there's a really strong connection between entrepreneurship and performance or leadership and sports so i appreciate yeah. the thread there get around some lions even if you feel you don't fit i, I i'm a big believer in that message uh, Laura, you, in all of the ways that, that you've written through this, it, it's also really clear that you've got like a pretty good no, you like, you know, your nose, you know, mm-hmm. your boundaries pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. I guess we'll make this the last question before we wrap. And I, I just, I could keep going on forever, but <laughs> we'll have to do a part two, Aaron. We'll do we'll, part two. We're going to have to, uh, <laughs> we'll get everyone a chance to read this and buy it and support you first. No is uncomfortable. No can feel if you're a giver, and I like to be a giver, I sense that you are as well. No can be the most powerful tool for a giver to get clear and move the chains a little faster. American football reference. The the practice of setting boundaries takes time. So what Mm -hmm. advice would you give to someone that needs to work on their boundary setting? I love this question too. I've actually been coaching someone recently on this um, who's an executive. Um, Boundaries is huge, right? Um, Here's the thing. A lot of people, when they try to set boundaries, they end up breaking them because it feels uncomfortable. So here's a challenge, right? I'm going to ask you to time block in your calendar. And why am I going to do this? So one of the biggest things that people struggle with when it comes to boundaries and from a work setting, for example, right? They have a start to their day, but they don't necessarily have an end to their day, right? So therefore they might stay on at the office or if they're working from home, they're just going to, oh, I'm going to send this one last email. I'm just going to reply to this. I'm just going to do that. And then what happens with family time or um, whatever else it is that you want to do in your own free time? 
work is something to me that is a huge part of my life that I don't actually feel like I'm working, quite honestly. So I would also say, you know, establish what your why is, what your purpose is, what your vision is and mission. Does it align with what you're doing in the workspace? And if that answer is yes, it does, then still set those boundaries to know when it when you're working and when you now want to maybe still do some of that stuff, but as a free time kind of thing, if that makes any sense. So what I'm trying to say is you have a start to the beginning of your day, but you also have an end to it. And people say to me, oh, but Lara, I've got, I won't be able to get everything that I need to get done in that time. Yes, you can. In that case, it's not a um, time issue that you have. It's a prioritization issue Amen. that you have. And so therefore, I know it, it's true. It's true. And what do I, you'll know this, but chapter six of the book, I refer to the Eisenhower matrix. Okay. And that teaches you about what's important and urgent, what's not important, yep. not urgent and so on and so on. And I would challenge you to say, which box do you spend most of your time in? And the box that you actually want to be in is the important and not urgent. Why? Because when things are really urgent all the time, it increases the anxiety, it increases the stress, it increases um, our cortisol levels to just start to spike. And so therefore, that's going to impact the functioning of how, how our brain operates, right? We might not make the right decisions or we might make the wrong decision or maybe we, we um, don't make a decision at all. Okay. And so that impacts everything else that we do. So therefore, um, my my biggest thing is when it comes to boundaries, block your time on your calendar. So have a beginning part of the day, have an end part of the day, and even say, okay, structure the week. Say Mondays, this day is going to be dedicated to this. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, maybe in the mornings, this is going to be dedicated to this activity. In the afternoons, it's going to be dedicated to this, right? Set those boundaries and make sure everybody else around you knows it. So if you are a leader and you have an assistant, they can see in your calendar, it's very clear. Oh, okay. And these are the boundaries. If you're an executive and you are just starting this with boundaries, communicate that right and stick with it follow through you gotta follow through if you don't follow through guess what it's just like if you have a child and you 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 tell them not to do something or you say you give them a uh, you say i'm gonna it's a consequence right but you don't follow through guess what they then think oh okay it doesn't matter because they're just gonna cave anyway it's the same thing it's the same thing in the workplace right you just have to follow through and you have to have self-worth and know your worth. I actually just spoke about this recently, but you got to know your worth because if you don't know yours, nobody else is going to know it and then you won't have respect. When you set boundaries, it's it might be scary to some, but let me tell you that the respect that you have as a result skyrockets and people actually want to aspire to be like you and they think oh wow okay and then you get more done you're more successful because now you're more productive in that time right set those boundaries i'm i, I love that question i could keep going on i'll stop now but oh. i just keep going on <laughs> that is straight napalm I, that is such an awesome awesome energy in that answer i can tell it oh, it comes from like your soul there I'm Love it. Yes. Also a really important subject. I, I think that there's a a challenge in entrepreneurship where we take on clients. It's, the beginning becomes the end where we take on clients because we have this startup mentality, but at at success, you're saying no all the time. Yeah. Man, so good. Okay. We could probably talk for 16, maybe 17 <laughs> more hours. We're going to keep it chill here. We're going to get back to Arizona sunshine. Uh, I probably need to go for a little walk. It's nice today. What else is new? <laughs> uh, Laura, where, aside from you going to buy this book, which you sh at this point should be obvious, where can people learn more about you? Where can they pay attention and follow along? Uh, LinkedIn is probably one of the best platforms that anybody can follow me on. I post on there daily, um, with some, a lot of inspiring content, but also some, you know, there's tools as well that you can use. Um, but I just, I love to help inspire people, you know, with whatever it is that you're going through that particular day or morning or whatever. Um, LinkedIn is probably one of the better platforms to follow me on. I am on Instagram as well and Facebook. Um, if you want to go to LinkedIn, just type Lara Jones. It's L-A-R-A. -A. There is no U, okay? No Get U. Get that U out of there. Get that U out of there, exactly. We don't need that U. <laughs> L-A-R-A, <laughs> -A, right? L-A-R-A, -A, Lara Jones. Um, type Lara Jones in. And then um, if you if I don't come up for whatever reason, just type Grit Global. Lara Jones Grit Global um, or Lara Jones Be a Legend. Um, and those are the names of my companies. And so then I will come up. Um, that's the easiest way to follow me. Um, also, I just want to give something away to the, to the listeners today. Um, 
if they are willing and open to this. So yes, buy the book, Hunt or Be Hunted. It's on Amazon. Um, it will change the way that you think about a lot of situations. It can also help how you might be dealing with somebody in your life, whether it's at work or at home, that might be challenging and you're not sure how to help them. Um, buy the book, read it, right? Um, it is on Amazon. It's worldwide. Just type Hunt or Be Hunted, Lara Jones, and that will come up. Um, if you text the word GRIT, to 55444, right? So that's text the word GRIT to 55444. So get your phones out and, t- and just text that word GRIT to 55444. You will get um, access to my GRIT global guide. And what that means is an accountability guide for GRIT. So it's got a few different um, activities on there that you can do for the G, the R, the I, and the T to help harness some of those skills. Um, and just gives a little overview. So if there's one thing that you've been struggling with that you, like this is called get out of the own, uh, own way show, right? This is one way to do it. So if you want to get out of your own way, you first of all, you've got to write down the one thing, right? That you are going to commit to doing that you know you should be doing, but you haven't. And how are you going to be able to do that? Text GRIT to 55444, get the guide, and it will teach you how to be able to do that. So that's, I encourage everyone to do that. Um, if anyone's an Instagrammer or Facebook, then uh, my um, name for that is at official Lara Jones, official Lara Jones, L-A-R-A, okay, official Lara Jones. So there you go. There's plenty of different ways to follow me, but LinkedIn, I'm very active. I'm active on all, all of the platforms, but LinkedIn is just, uh, it's a huge platform for me. So um yeah, that's and also my website is larajones.com if you want to learn a little bit more about some of my work. Um, I was just featured as well. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you know about this, but I was just featured on the NASDAQ billboard in New York Times Square because of my work and winning um, some of these awards and in, in because of the book. So that was also something that was incredible that I'd, I'd love to um, share with people so they know, okay, she's not just some person that's just come up with this you know this is something that has taken a lot of research a lot of time and obviously my experience to put together but I assure you I did it because I want to be able to help empower other people because I nearly died that night and I'm still here for a reason so there you go well you got two homework assignments obviously get your behinds to LinkedIn to pay attention to what Laura's doing you also have an assignment to go to Amazon and get a copy of the book Laura this has been this has just been a remarkable day. I, I can appreciate the amount of struggle and challenge that you've been through and how you've reframed that. I can appreciate your attentiveness to both the creatives and the need for story, as well as the need for structure and framework and science. That is a, a remarkable duo. And it's clear you're making a dent, and I'm here to help you keep on making it. It's also cool to hear that coaches have coaches. I think that statement needs to be said oh. louder and louder and louder. If you meet a coach that doesn't have a coach, please walk away. Just yeah. walk away. Uh, <laughs> Laura, it's true. So, so awesome. Yeah. Well, it, this has been an absolute pleasure, Aaron. And thank you so much again for having me on the show and sharing your wonderful audience with me today. Hopefully, you know, there's been a few little different golden nuggets that people will pick up from this. Um, yeah, I'm always here for questions too. So if anyone wants to reach out and ask a question, find me on LinkedIn, send a message off to me. I'm happy to connect. So I'd say take her up on that, folks. Not many <laughs> people offer that. <laughs> true. This Laura, is true. But yes, I'm here. It's a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> she's a real person it's monday we're starting off the week pretty strong uh, i love recording these on mondays they always make my week better this is a phenomenal fire starting conversation to begin the week thank you so much for being here thank you aaron appreciate it <laughs>